Implementation of Occupational Health and Safety in Industry. Module 1. Introduction to Occupational Health and Safety. 1. Definition of OHS. 2. Legal and Regulatory Framework. 3. Importance of OHS for Individuals and Organizations. 4. Benefits of a Strong OHS Culture. Module 2. Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. 1. Types of Hazards. Physical, Chemical, Biological, Ergonomic, and Psychosocial. 2. Risk Assessment Process. 3. Control Measures. Elimination, Substitution, Engineering Controls, Administrative Controls, and PP. Module 3. OHS Management Systems. 1. Elements of an OHS Management System OHS MS. 2. Planning and Implementation. 3. Monitoring and Evaluation. 4. Continuous Improvement. Module 4. Emergency Preparedness and Response. 1. Developing Emergency Response Plans. 2. Evacuation Procedures. 3. Fire Safety. 4. First Aid. Module 5. Workplace Inspections and Investigations. 1. Conducting Workplace Inspections. 2. Investigating Accidents and Incidents. 3. Corrective Actions. Module 6. Employee Training and Communication. 1. Developing Effective Training Programs. 2. Importance of Communication. 3. Safety Meetings and Toolbox Talks. Implementation of Occupational Health and Safety in Industry. Module 1. Introduction to Occupational Health and Safety. 1. Definition of OHS. 2. Legal and Regulatory Framework. 3. Importance of OHS for Individuals and Organizations. 4. Benefits of a Strong OHS Culture. Definition of OHS. OHS is a multidisciplinary field concerned with the safety, health, and well-being of people in the workplace. It involves the anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control of hazards associated with occupational activities. OHS encompasses a wide range of factors that can affect workers' physical and mental health, including but not limited to a. Physical hazards, such as noise, vibration, radiation, temperature extremes, hazardous substances, and ergonomic risks. b. Chemical hazards, like exposure to toxic substances, gases, fumes, and dusts. c. Biological hazards, such as exposure to bacteria, viruses, and other microorganisms. And finally, d. Psychosocial hazards, which include stress, violence, bullying, and harassment. Be informed that the effective OHS management involves creating a safe and healthy work environment through the implementation of preventive measures, such as hazard identification and risk assessment, control measures, emergency preparedness, and employee training, as well as monitoring and analyzing of health and safety performance. The ultimate goal of OHS is to prevent work-related injuries, illnesses, and fatalities, and to promote a positive and productive workplace culture. Legal and Regulatory Framework The Legal and Regulatory Framework for Occupational Health and Safety OHS is a complex system of laws, regulations, and standards designed to protect workers from harm. It varies significantly across different countries, but the core principles remain consistent. Key Components of the Legal and Regulatory Framework Occupational Safety and Health Acts these are the primary pieces of legislation that establish the fundamental rights and responsibilities of employers, employees, and government agencies regarding OHS. Regulations. Detailed rules and standards developed to implement the provisions of the OHS Act. They cover a wide range of topics, such as hazard identification, risk assessment, control measures, emergency procedures, and record keeping. Standards. Voluntary guidelines developed by industry associations, professional organizations, or government agencies to promote best practices in OHS.
Compliance with standards is often not mandatory, but can be used as evidence of due diligence. Common OHS legislation. While the specific laws vary, many countries have legislation covering. 1. General OHS duties. Outlining the responsibilities of employers and employees to ensure a safe and healthy workplace. 2. Hazard identification and risk assessment. Requiring employers to identify and assess workplace hazards and implement control measures. 3. Emergency preparedness and response. Mandating the development and implementation of emergency plans. 4. Workplace inspections and investigations. Setting out procedures for conducting workplace inspections and investigating accidents and incidents. 5. Worker compensation. Providing financial compensation for workers injured or disabled on the job. 6. Occupational diseases. Covering diseases caused or aggravated by workplace conditions. Enforcement and compliance. Government agencies are responsible for enforcing OHS laws and regulations through inspections, investigations, and issuing penalties for noncompliance. Employers must comply with these laws and regulations to avoid legal consequences and protect their workers. Importance of Understanding the Legal Framework A thorough understanding of the legal and regulatory framework is essential for OHS professionals. It enables them to Identify potential legal and regulatory requirements Develop and implement effective OHS programs Conduct risk assessments and control measures Respond to incidents and investigations. And finally, provide training and education to employees. Importance of OHS for individuals and organizations. Importance for individuals. 1. Preservation of life and health. The most fundamental benefit of OHS is protecting workers from injuries, illnesses, and fatalities. A safe and healthy work environment is essential for physical and mental well being. Two. Improved quality of life. OHS contributes to a better quality of life by preventing work-related stress, fatigue, and musculoskeletal disorders. 3. Peace of mind. Knowing that the workplace is safe and that employers prioritize safety can reduce anxiety and stress for employees. 4. Personal fulfillment. Contributing to a safe and healthy workplace can be personally rewarding and fulfilling. Importance for organizations. One. Legal compliance. Adherence to OHS regulations is essential to avoid legal penalties, fines, and reputational damage. 2. Financial benefits. Effective OHS management can lead to significant cost savings through reduced accidents, workers' compensation claims, absenteeism, and medical expenses. 3. Increased productivity. A safe and healthy workplace can improve employee morale, reduce turnover, and enhance productivity. 4. Enhanced reputation. A strong commitment to OHS can improve an organization's reputation as a responsible employer and attract and retain top talent. 5. Risk management. OHS helps identify and control workplace hazards, reducing the risk of accidents and incidents. 6. Business continuity. By preventing disruptions caused by accidents or illnesses, OHS contributes to business continuity and operational efficiency. 7. Social responsibility. Organizations have a moral and ethical obligation to protect the health and safety of their employees. So, prioritizing OHS, organizations can create a positive and sustainable work environment that benefits both employees and the business as a whole. Benefits of a strong OHS culture. A strong OHS culture is more than just compliance. It's a mindset that permeates every level of an organization. The benefits are far-reaching and impactful for employees, for organizations, and also for society, for employees. Improved morale and job satisfaction. Employees feel valued and cared for when safety is prioritized. Reduce stress and anxiety. Knowing that the workplace is safe reduces mental health burdens. Enhance job performance. Employees are more focused and productive when they feel secure. Personal growth and development. Safety training and involvement foster a sense of empowerment. 
for organizations. Reduced accidents and injuries. A strong safety culture leads to fewer incidents, reducing costs and downtime. Lower insurance premiums. A positive safety record often translates into reduced insurance costs. Increased productivity. Engaged and safe employees are more productive. Enhanced reputation. A strong OHS culture attracts and retains top talent, improving the company's image. Improved financial performance. Reduced costs, increased productivity, and a positive reputation contribute to overall financial health. Legal compliance. A safety-focused culture helps ensure adherence to regulations, avoiding penalties. Business continuity. A resilient safety culture helps maintain operations during challenging times. Innovation. A culture of safety encourages open communication and problem solving, fostering innovation. For society. Reduced societal costs. Fewer workplace injuries and illnesses decrease the overall burden on healthcare systems. Improved public health. A strong OHS culture contributes to a healthier and safer society. Eventually, cultivating a strong OHS culture, organizations can create a sustainable and thriving workplace that benefits everyone involved. Module 2. Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. 1. Types of Hazards. Physical, Chemical, Biological, Ergonomic, and Psychosocial. 2. Risk Assessment Process. 3. Control Measures. Elimination. Substitution, Engineering Controls, Administrative Controls, and PP. Types of Hazards Physical Hazards Physical hazards are those that can cause injury or harm through direct contact or exposure. They include Noise Excessive noise can damage hearing and contribute to stress. Vibration Prolonged exposure to vibration can cause musculoskeletal disorders. Radiation Exposure to ionizing or non-ionizing radiation can lead to various health issues, including cancer. Extreme temperatures, both heat and cold stress can be dangerous, leading to heat stroke, hypothermia, or other health problems. Lighting, inadequate lighting can cause eye strain, accidents, and fatigue. Slips, trips, and falls, poor housekeeping, wet floors, and obstacles can lead to injuries. Machinery hazards. Moving parts, sharp edges, and electrical hazards associated with machinery can cause serious injuries. Chemical hazards. Chemical hazards arise from exposure to harmful substances. They can cause acute or chronic health effects. Examples include toxic substances, chemicals that can cause poisoning or death, corrosive substances, chemicals that can burn or destroy tissue, flammable substances, Chemicals that can easily ignite and cause fires or explosions. Irritants. Substances that cause skin or respiratory irritation. Sensitizers. Substances that can cause allergic reactions. Carcinogens. Substances that can cause cancer. Biological hazards. Biological hazards come from living organisms or their products. They can cause infections or diseases. Examples include. Bacteria, microorganisms that can cause various illnesses. Viruses, microscopic organisms that can cause infections. Fungi, organisms that can cause respiratory or skin infections. Parasites, organisms that live on or in other organisms. Bloodborne pathogens, viruses or bacteria transmitted through blood, such as HIV and hepatitis B. Ergonomic hazards. Ergonomic hazards arise from the design and arrangement of workplaces, equipment, and tasks. They can lead to musculoskeletal disorders. Examples include Repetitive motions. Repeated movements can cause strain on muscles, tendons, and nerves. Awkward postures. Prolonged or uncomfortable postures can lead to musculoskeletal pain. Overexertion. Excessive force or lifting can cause injuries. Vibration. Exposure to vibration can cause musculoskeletal disorders. Static loading. Maintaining the same position for extended periods can cause discomfort. Psychosocial hazards. 
psychosocial hazards arise from work organization, management styles, and interpersonal relationships. They can affect mental health and well-being. Examples include Work overload. Excessive workload can lead to stress and burnout. Underutilization. Lack of challenges or opportunities can lead to boredom and dissatisfaction. Role ambiguity. Unclear job expectations can cause stress and anxiety. Job insecurity. Fear of job loss can lead to stress and decreased motivation. Violence and aggression. Exposure to violence or aggression in the workplace can have severe psychological and physical consequences. Hence, understanding these different types of hazards is essential for identifying and controlling risks in the workplace. Risk Assessment Process A risk assessment is a systematic process of identifying potential hazards and evaluating the risks associated with them. Its goal is to implement control measures to eliminate or reduce these risks. Steps in the Risk Assessment Process 1. Identify Hazards Conduct a thorough workplace inspection. Identify potential sources of harm, such as machinery, chemicals, ergonomics, and work processes. Consider the environment and potential hazards within it. Involve employees in the process, as they often have first-hand knowledge of risks. 2. Evaluate the risks. A quantitative risk assessment approach uses data and numbers to define risk level by Assess the likelihood of harm occurring probability. Determine the severity of potential harm consequences. The risk level is the result of multiplying the likelihood by severity. Then, prioritize risks based on their severity and likelihood. 3. Determine control measures. Implement controls to eliminate hazards or minimize risks. Consider the hierarchy of controls. 1. Elimination. Remove the hazard entirely. 2. Substitution. Replace the hazard with a less hazardous alternative. 3. Engineering controls. Isolate people from the hazard. 4. Administrative controls. Change work practices or procedures. 5. Personal protective equipment PPE. Protect individuals from hazards as a last resort. 4. Record findings. Document the risk assessment process, including identified hazards, risk evaluations, and control measures. Keep records for future reference and to demonstrate compliance. 5. Review and update. Regularly review the risk assessment to ensure its accuracy and effectiveness. Update the assessment when changes occur in the workplace, such as new equipment, processes, or personnel. Risk assessment tools. Various tools can assist in the risk assessment process. Checklists, pre-prepared lists of potential hazards. Risk matrices, tables used to evaluate the likelihood and severity of risks. Job Safety Analysis JSA, a step-by-step -step breakdown of a job to identify hazards. What if analysis, brainstorming potential hazards and consequences. Failure Mode and Effects Analysis FMEA a systematic process for identifying potential failures and their effects. By following these steps and using appropriate tools, organizations can effectively manage risks and create a safer work environment. Control measures. Control measures are actions taken to eliminate or reduce risks in the workplace. The hierarchy of controls outlines the preferred order in which these measures should be implemented. First, elimination. This is the most effective control measure. It involves removing the hazard entirely from the workplace. For example, replacing a hazardous chemical with a safer alternative or redesigning a process to eliminate the need for a particular task. Second, substitution. If elimination is not possible, substitution involves replacing the hazard with something less hazardous. This could involve using a less toxic chemical, a quieter machine, or a less physically demanding task. Third, engineering controls. Engineering controls isolate people from hazards. They involve modifying the workplace or equipment to reduce exposure. Examples include ventilation systems to remove contaminants from the air, enclosures around machinery, noise reduction equipment, 
ergonomic workstation design. Fourth, administrative controls. Administrative controls change the way work is organized or performed. They include job rotation to reduce repetitive tasks, work schedules to limit exposure, training and education to improve worker knowledge, safe work procedures, regular maintenance of equipment, and finally, personal protective equipment, DP. DPE is the last line of defense and should only be used when other control measures are not feasible or sufficient. It protects the individual worker from hazards. Examples include helmets, safety glasses, gloves, respiratory protection, hearing protection. It's important to note that PPE does not eliminate the hazard and relies on the individual to use it correctly. Therefore, it should be used in conjunction with other control measures. Organizations can significantly reduce the risk of workplace injuries and illnesses by following the hierarchy of controls and implementing appropriate control measures. Module 3, OHS Management Systems. 1. Elements of an OHS Management System OHSMS. 2. Planning and Implementation. 3. Monitoring and Evaluation. 4. Continuous Improvement Elements of an OHS Management System OHSMS An OHSMS is a structured framework of policies, procedures, and practices for managing occupational health and safety risks. It's designed to prevent injuries, illnesses, and fatalities in the workplace. The core elements of an OHSMS are 1. Policy and Commitment Clear OHS Policy a formal statement of the organization's commitment to OHS. Top management leadership. Demonstrated commitment from senior management. Employee involvement. Engaging employees in OHS activities and decision making. 2. Planning. Hazard identification and risk assessment. Identifying potential hazards and evaluating associated risks. Setting OHS objectives and targets. Establishing measurable goals for OHS improvement. Developing OHS programs. Creating plans to address identified risks and achieve objectives. 3. Implementation and operation. Structure and responsibilities. Defining roles and responsibilities for OHS management. Training and competence. Providing employees with necessary OHS knowledge and skills. Communication and consultation. Effective communication with employees and stakeholders. Documentation. Maintaining records of OHS activities and performance. Emergency preparedness and response. Developing plans for handling emergencies. Contingency planning. Identifying potential disruptions and developing response plans. 4. Performance monitoring and measurement. Monitoring and measurement. Collecting data on OHS performance indicators. Evaluation of OHS performance. Assessing the effectiveness of OHS activities. Auditing. Conducting regular OHS audits to identify strengths and weaknesses. 5. Review and Improvement Management Review Regularly reviewing the OHSMS to identify areas for improvement. Continual Improvement Implementing changes to enhance OHS performance. There is no doubt that, implementing these elements, organizations can establish a robust OHSMS that effectively manages risks and promotes a safe and healthy workplace. Planning and Implementation Planning. The planning phase involves translating the OHS policy into actionable steps. Key components include hazard identification and risk assessment. This is the foundation of OHS planning. It involves systematically identifying potential hazards in the workplace and evaluating the associated risks. Setting OHS objectives and targets. Based on the risk assessment, organizations set specific measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound smart OHS objectives and targets. 
These should align with the overall business objectives. Developing OHS programs. This involves creating detailed plans to address identified hazards and risks. These programs may include emergency preparedness and response plans, training programs for employees, workplace inspections and monitoring procedures, incident investigation procedures, health and safety committees or representative involvement. Implementation. Implementation is the process of putting the OHS plan into action. Key aspects include Resource allocation Providing the necessary resources, including budget, personnel, and equipment, to support OHS activities. Communication and consultation Effective communication with employees and other stakeholders is crucial. This involves informing employees about OHS risks, procedures, in their roles and responsibilities. Training and competence. Ensuring that employees have the necessary knowledge and skills to perform their jobs safely. Documentation. Maintaining accurate and up-to-date records of OHS activities, training, incidents, and inspections. Emergency preparedness. Ensuring that emergency plans are in place and regularly tested. Monitoring and measurement. Continuously monitoring OHS performance through key performance indicators KPIs. Successful implementation requires strong leadership, employee involvement, and a commitment to continuous improvement. Monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring and evaluation are crucial components of an OHS MS to assess its effectiveness and identify areas for improvement. Monitoring is the ongoing collection and analysis of data to track progress towards OHS objectives. This involves Key performance indicators KPIs Identifying relevant metrics to measure OHS performance, such as accident rates, incident rates, near-miss rates, and compliance rates. Data collection Gathering data through various methods, including records, surveys, inspections, and audits. Data analysis. Analyzing collected data to identify trends, patterns, and areas of concern. Performance reporting. Communicating monitoring results to management and employees. Evaluation. Evaluation is a systematic assessment of the OHSMS to determine its effectiveness, efficiency, and impact. It involves setting evaluation criteria. Defining the standards and benchmarks against which the OHSMS will be evaluated. Data collection. Gathering data through various methods, including interviews, surveys, document reviews, and performance data. Data analysis. Analyzing collected data to assess the OHSMS's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. SWOT analysis. Evaluation report. Preparing a comprehensive report summarizing the evaluation findings and recommendations. Benefits of monitoring and evaluation. Improved OHS performance. Identifying areas for improvement and implementing corrective actions. Demonstrated commitment to OHS. Showing stakeholders that OHS is a priority. Compliance with regulations. Ensuring adherence to legal requirements. Continuous improvement. Fostering a culture of continuous improvement. Resource allocation. Making informed decisions about resource allocation for OHS activities. So, following effectively monitoring and evaluating of the OHS MS, organizations can demonstrate their commitment to safety, enhance performance, and create a safer workplace for everyone. Continuous improvement. Continuous improvement in OHSMS is the cornerstone of a successful OHSMS. It's the ongoing process of identifying, analyzing, and implementing changes to enhance OHS performance. Key components of continuous improvement. Employee involvement. Encouraging employees to contribute ideas for improvement is crucial. This can be achieved through suggestion boxes, safety committees, or open communication channels. Data analysis. 
Utilizing data collected during monitoring and evaluation to identify trends, patterns, and areas for improvement. Root cause analysis. Investigating incidents and near misses to determine the underlying causes and implement corrective actions. Benchmarking. Comparing OHS performance to industry standards or best practices to identify areas for improvement. Pilot testing. Implementing changes on a small scale before full-scale implementation to assess their effectiveness. PDCA cycle. Plan Do Check Act. Structured approach to problem solving and improvement. Tools and techniques. Several tools and techniques can support continuous improvement. Kaizen. A Japanese philosophy of continuous improvement focusing on small, incremental changes. Six Sigma. A data-driven approach to reducing defects and improving processes. Lean. A methodology focused on eliminating waste and improving efficiency. Failure mode and effects analysis. FMEA. A proactive approach to identifying potential failures and their effects. Benefits of continuous improvement. Enhanced OHS performance. Increased employee engagement. Cost reduction. Improved organizational efficiency. Stronger safety culture. With embedding continuous improvement into the OHS MS, organizations can create a culture of safety and proactively identify and address hazards. Module 4. Emergency Preparedness and Response. 1. Developing Emergency Response Plans. 2. Evacuation procedures. 3. Fire safety. 4. First aid. Developing emergency response plans. An emergency response plan outlines procedures for handling various emergencies that may occur in the workplace. It ensures a coordinated and effective response, minimizing harm to people and property. Key components of an emergency response plan. Hazard identification. Identify potential emergencies, such as fires, chemical spills, natural disasters, or active shooter situations. Assess the likelihood and potential impact of each hazard. Emergency response teams. Establish emergency response teams with clear roles and responsibilities. Provide necessary training and equipment. Communication procedures. Develop effective communication systems for alerting employees, emergency services, and other stakeholders. Designate communication channels e.g. alarms, public address systems, mobile devices. Establish a chain of command for decision-making. Evacuation procedures. Develop clear evacuation plans, including escape routes, assembly points, and accounting procedures. Conduct regular evacuation drills. Emergency equipment. Ensure availability of necessary emergency equipment, such as fire extinguishers, first aid kits, and emergency lighting. Conduct regular inspections and maintenance. Training and drills. Provide comprehensive training to employees on emergency procedures. Conduct regular drills to test the plan's effectiveness. Coordination with external agencies. Establish relationships with local emergency services, fire department, police, ambulance. Develop procedures for coordinating response efforts. Crisis management. Designate a crisis management team responsible for handling media inquiries and public relations. Develop a crisis communication plan. Additional considerations. Specific hazards. Tailor the plan to address unique workplace hazards. Regular review and updates. Regularly review and update the plan to reflect changes in the workplace or emergency procedures. Involve employees. Encourage employee participation in developing and implementing the plan. Testing and evaluation. Conduct drills and exercises to assess the plan's effectiveness and identify areas for improvement. Organizations can develop comprehensive emergency response plans that enhance safety and preparedness.
By following these guidelines and involving all stakeholders. Evacuation Procedures Evacuation procedures are a critical component of an emergency response plan. They outline the steps to be taken when it becomes necessary to evacuate a building or facility. Key Elements of Evacuation Procedures Evacuation Routes Clearly marked and easily accessible exit routes should be established. Multiple exit routes should be identified to accommodate different emergency scenarios. Emergency exit signs should be prominently displayed. Assembly points. Designated assembly points should be located in a safe and secure area away from the building. Assembly points should be clearly marked and communicated to all employees. Evacuation signals. A clear and easily recognizable evacuation signal should be established, e.g., alarm, public address announcement. Employees should be trained to respond promptly to the evacuation signal. Evacuation procedures. Step-by-step -step procedures for evacuating the building should be developed and communicated to all employees. Procedures should include instructions for securing work areas, closing doors, and accounting for personnel. Evacuation drills. Regular evacuation drills should be conducted to familiarize employees with evacuation procedures. Drills should test the effectiveness of the evacuation plan and identify areas for improvement. Additional considerations. People with disabilities. Evacuation procedures should accommodate the needs of people with disabilities. Emergency lighting. Ensure adequate emergency lighting is available to guide people during evacuations. Obstructed exits. Identify potential obstructions to exit routes and develop alternative plans. Communication. Establish clear communication channels during evacuations, including designated personnel to coordinate the process. When developing and practicing effective evacuation procedures, we can say that organizations can significantly reduce the risk of injuries and fatalities in emergency situations. Fire safety. Fire safety encompasses a range of measures to prevent fires, limit their spread, and ensure the safety of people and property in case of a fire. Fire prevention. Fire hazards. Identify potential fire hazards like flammable materials, electrical faults, heating equipment, and smoking areas. Fire safety equipment. Install and maintain fire safety equipment such as fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, and sprinklers. Employee training. Educate employees about fire safety procedures, including evacuation plans, fire extinguisher use, and emergency contacts. Housekeeping. Maintain a clean and organized workplace to reduce fire risks. Electrical safety. Regularly inspect electrical equipment and wiring to prevent electrical fires. Smoking policies. Implement clear smoking policies and provide designated smoking areas. Fire detection and alarm systems. Smoke detectors. Install smoke detectors on every level of the building and test them regularly. Fire alarm systems. Install fire alarm systems connected to a central monitoring station. Emergency lighting. Provide emergency lighting to facilitate evacuation in case of power failure. Fire suppression systems. Fire extinguishers. Ensure proper placement and maintenance of fire extinguishers. Sprinkler systems. Install sprinkler systems in high risk areas. Fire blankets. Provide fire blankets for small fires. Evacuation procedures. Clear exit routes. Ensure clear and well-marked escape routes. Emergency exits. Provide adequate emergency exits. Fire drills. Conduct regular fire drills to familiarize employees with evacuation procedures. Assembly points. Designate safe assembly points outside the building. Fire investigation. Investigation procedures. 
establish procedures for investigating fire incidents to identify causes and prevent recurrence. Additional considerations. Fire safety inspections. Conduct regular fire safety inspections to identify potential hazards. Fire safety signage. Use clear and visible fire safety signage. Fire department coordination. Maintain a good relationship with the local fire department. Eventually implementing comprehensive fire safety measures, organizations can significantly reduce the risk of fires and protect the lives and property of employees and occupants. First aid. First aid is the immediate care given to someone who has been injured or suddenly becomes ill. It is often performed by someone with basic medical training and is intended to preserve life, prevent the condition from worsening, and promote recovery until medical help arrives. Key Components of First Aid Assessment Quickly assess the situation to determine the nature of the injury or illness and the necessary first aid measures. DRSABCD Action Plan This is a common first aid acronym. Danger Ensure safety for yourself and the injured person. Response Check if the person is conscious by talking, touching, and shouting. Send for help. Call emergency services if needed. Airway. Check if the person's airway is clear. Breathing. Check if the person is breathing only. CPR. If the person is not breathing, perform CPR. Defibrillation. Use a defibrillator if available. Wound care. Clean and dress minor cuts, scrapes, and burns. Bleeding control. Apply pressure to control bleeding. Fractures and sprains. Mobilize injured limbs and apply cold compresses. Burns. Pool the burned area with cold water and cover with a sterile dressing. Choking. Perform the Heimlich maneuver if necessary. Poisoning. Identify the poison and follow appropriate procedures. Heat-related illnesses. Recognize and treat heat stroke, heat exhaustion, and dehydration. Related illnesses. Recognize and treat hypothermia and frostbite. First aid kit. A well-stocked first aid kit is essential for providing immediate care. It should include sterile dressings, bandages, antiseptic wipes, pain relievers, antihistamines, tweezers, scissors, gloves, first aid manual, first aid training. Formal first aid training is crucial for effectively responding to emergencies. It provides the knowledge and skills to handle various situations confidently. Module 5. Workplace Inspections and Investigations 1. Conducting Workplace Inspections 2. Investigating Accidents and Incidents 3. Corrective Actions Conducting Workplace Inspections Workplace inspections are a systematic process to identify and assess potential hazards in the work environment. They are essential for preventing accidents, injuries, and illnesses. Purpose of Workplace Inspections Identify existing and potential hazards. Assess the effectiveness of control measures. Ensure compliance with safety regulations. Gather information for risk assessments. Promote a safety culture. Now, let's talk about types of inspections. First, routine inspections. Regular inspections of the entire workplace. Second, focused inspections. Targeted inspections of specific areas or activities. Third, incident investigations. Inspections following accidents or near misses. Last but not least, compliance inspections. Inspections to ensure adherence to regulations. Steps in conducting a workplace inspection. First, planning includes multiple steps like define the scope of the inspection entire workplace, specific area, or process. Assemble an inspection team with relevant expertise. 
Develop a checklist or inspection form. Second, preparation. Review previous inspection reports and accident data. Gather necessary equipment e.g. measuring devices, cameras. Inform employees about the inspection. Third, inspection. Observe work activities and conditions. Identify hazards and potential risks. Take photographs or measurements. Interview employees about safety concerns. Check compliance with safety procedures and regulations. Fourth, reporting. Document findings and recommendations. Prioritize hazards based on severity and likelihood. Assign responsibilities for corrective actions. Communicate findings to management and employees. Fifth, follow up. Verify that corrective actions have been implemented. Schedule follow-up inspections to assess effectiveness. Inspection checklist. A checklist can help ensure a thorough inspection. Typical items to include. Housekeeping and cleanliness. Emergency exits and signage. Electrical safety. Machinery and equipment. Ventilation and lighting. Personal protective equipment PP usage. Material handling and storage. Chemical storage and handling. Ergonomics. Housekeeping. Emergency procedures. Involving employees. Employee involvement is crucial for successful inspections. Encourage employees to report hazards and provide feedback on working conditions. In this lecture, we will talk about investigating accidents and incidents. Accident and incident investigations are crucial for identifying the root causes of events and preventing their recurrence. They involve a systematic process of gathering information, analyzing data, and implementing corrective actions. Purpose of investigations Investigation is essential to identify the root causes of accidents and incidents, prevent similar incidents from happening again, Improve safety performance. Gather evidence for legal and insurance purposes. Meet regulatory requirements. Investigation process. The investigation process is performed throughout these steps. First, immediate response. Secure the accident scene. Provide first aid if necessary. Notify relevant personnel and emergency services. Preserve evidence. Second, investigation team. Assemble a team with relevant expertise such as safety professionals, supervisors, witnesses. Assign clear roles and responsibilities. Third, information gathering. Collect information from witnesses, documents, photographs, and physical evidence. Interview involved parties and witnesses. Review safety procedures, training records, and maintenance logs. Fourth, analysis. Identify the sequence of events leading to the incident. Determine the immediate and underlying causes. Identify contributing factors. Evaluate the effectiveness of existing control measures. Fifth, corrective actions. Develop specific actions to address the root causes. Assign responsibilities and timelines for implementing corrective actions. Monitor the effectiveness of corrective actions. 6. Reporting. Document the investigation findings, including causes, corrective actions, and lessons learned. Share the report with relevant personnel. Now. It is the appropriate time to discuss the investigation techniques. The most applicable technique, which is widely used in industrial incident investigation is 5 whys. It is a technique to identify root causes by repeatedly asking why until the underlying problem is uncovered. Also we have fishbone diagram, a visual tool to identify potential causes of a problem. Finally. There is a technique for assessing strengths, weaknesses, 
opportunities, and threats related to the incident. It's called SWOT analysis. Important considerations. Timeliness. Conduct investigations promptly to preserve evidence. Objectivity. Avoid blaming individuals and focus on identifying system failures. Confidentiality. Protect the privacy of individuals involved in the incident. Learning culture. Foster a culture of learning and improvement through investigations. Follow-up. Ensure that corrective actions are implemented and monitored. So, conducting thorough and impartial investigations, industrial facilities can significantly reduce the risk of accidents and create a safer workplace. Corrective actions. Corrective actions are steps taken to eliminate the root cause of a problem or nonconformity to prevent its recurrence. They are essential for continuous improvement and risk mitigation. Key components of corrective actions. Identify the root cause. Determine the underlying reason for the problem, not just the symptoms. Tools like the five whys or fishbone diagrams can be helpful. Develop corrective actions. Create specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Smart actions to address the root cause. Assign responsibility. Clearly define who is responsible for implementing each corrective action. Set deadlines. Establish clear timelines for completing corrective actions. Implement corrective actions. Execute the planned actions efficiently and effectively. Verify effectiveness. Monitor the implementation of corrective actions and assess their impact. Document corrective actions. Maintain records of the entire corrective action process for future reference. Types of corrective actions. Engineering controls. Physical modifications to equipment, processes, or the workplace. Administrative controls. Changes to work procedures, policies, or management practices. Training and education. Improving employee knowledge and skills. Personal protective equipment. PP. Providing appropriate PP as a temporary measure while other controls are implemented. Corrective action verification. To ensure the effectiveness of corrective actions, it's essential to monitor the implementation process. Measure the impact of the actions on preventing recurrence. Conduct follow-up inspections or audits. Adjust corrective actions as needed. Module 6. Employee training and communication. 1. Developing effective training programs. 2. Importance of communication. 3. Safety meetings and toolbox talks. Developing effective training programs. Effective training programs are essential for building a competent and engaged workforce. They should align with organizational goals, address specific training needs, and deliver measurable results. Let's talk about the key steps in developing effective training programs. First, Needs assessment. Identify knowledge, skill, and attitude gaps among employees. Determine training objectives that align with business goals. Prioritize training needs based on urgency and impact. Second, learning objectives. Clearly define what participants should be able to do after completing the training. Use smart, specific, measurable, Achievable, relevant, time bound, objectives. Third, training design. Choose appropriate training methods classroom, online, on the job, simulation. Develop engaging training materials presentations, handouts, videos, interactive exercises. Consider learning styles and preferences of participants. Incorporate adult learning principles, experience-based learning, problem-solving, and self-directed learning. Fourth, delivery. Create a conducive learning environment. Use effective facilitation techniques. Provide opportunities for practice and feedback. 
Encourage participant interaction and engagement. Last but not least, valuation. Assess the effectiveness of the training program. Measure participant satisfaction and knowledge gain. Evaluate behavior changes and performance improvements. Use feedback to improve future training programs. Now, let's clarify the essential elements of effective training programs. Relevance. Ensure training content is directly related to job roles and responsibilities. Engagement. Create interactive and engaging training experiences. Practical application. Provide opportunities for learners to apply knowledge and skills in real-world situations. Feedback. Offer constructive feedback to help learners improve. Follow-up. Provide ongoing support and reinforcement after training. Training evaluation methods. There are two evaluation methodologies for training. First, Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation, which evaluate the following. Reaction. How participants felt about the training. Learning. What knowledge or skills were gained. Behavior. Changes in on-the-job performance. Results. Impact on organizational outcomes. Second. Return on investment ROI. Measuring the financial benefits of the training program. Eventually, we can assure that companies and industrial entities can develop a robust training infrastructure that drives employee performance and organizational success. By following these guidelines and continuously evaluating training programs, in this lecture, we will explain the importance of communication. It's clearly that Effective communication is the backbone of a successful occupational health and safety. OHS program. It ensures that information is shared clearly, accurately, and timely, leading to a safer work environment. The key roles of communication in OHS can be summarized in six points. First, information sharing. Disseminating safety policies, procedures, and regulations. Communicating hazard information and risk assessments. Sharing information about incident investigations and corrective actions. Second, employee engagement. Encouraging open communication about safety concerns and suggestions. Promoting employee involvement in safety committees and initiatives. Building trust and rapport between management and employees. Third, Training and education. Delivering safety training programs effectively. Providing clear instructions and demonstrations. Encouraging questions and discussions. Fourth, emergency preparedness. Developing and communicating emergency plans. Conducting emergency drills and exercises. Establishing clear communication channels during emergencies. Fifth, incident investigation. Gathering information from witnesses and involved parties. Communicating investigation findings and corrective actions. Sixth, safety culture. Fostering a culture of open communication and safety awareness. Encouraging employees to report near misses and hazards. Communication channels. Verbal communication. Meetings, toolbox talks, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Written communication. Safety manuals, policies, procedures, newsletters, emails. Visual communication. Signs, posters, diagrams, videos. Electronic communication. Intranet, email. Social media. There is no doubt that there are many challenges in OHS communication, such as language barriers, cultural differences, noise and distractions, technical jargon, information overload. So let's clarify the best practices to overcome communication barriers. 1. Using clear and simple language. 2. Active listening. 
3. Providing feedback. 4. Adapting communication style to the audience. 5. Utilizing multiple communication channels. In the last lecture in this course, let's talk about safety meetings and toolbox talks. Safety meetings and toolbox talks are essential tools for fostering a strong safety culture and promoting a safe work environment. While they share similar objectives, they differ in format, frequency, and depth. Starting with safety meetings. Safety meetings are typically more formal gatherings that focus on broader safety topics and involve a larger group of employees. They are often held regularly, such as monthly or quarterly. There are four key characteristics of safety meetings. First, purpose. Address general safety issues, review incident reports, discuss policy changes, and provide safety training. Second, format. Can include presentations, guest speakers, group discussions, and question and answer sessions. Third, duration. Usually longer than toolbox talks, ranging from 30 minutes to an hour or more. Fourth, attendance. Typically mandatory for all employees. We also have toolbox talks. Toolbox talks are informal, brief safety discussions held at the start of a shift or before specific tasks. They focus on immediate safety concerns and practical safety tips. The key characteristics of toolbox talks are 1. Purpose. Reinforce safety messages, address specific job hazards, and promote open communication. 2. Format. Short, informal discussions led by a supervisor or team leader. 3. Duration. Typically 5 to 10 minutes. 4. Attendance. Mandatory for employees starting a shift or task. Benefits of safety meetings and toolbox talks are listed below. Enhanced safety awareness. Improved communication. Increased employee engagement. Identification of potential hazards. Reinforcement of safety procedures. Compliance with safety regulations. Now, let's talk about effective practices. Effective practices for safety meetings and toolbox talks can be summed up in five points. 1. Regularity. Consistency is key to maintaining focus on safety. 2. Preparation. Plan meetings and talks in advance to ensure they are informative and engaging. 3. Employee involvement. Encourage participation and feedback from employees. 4. Follow-up. Address issues raised during meetings and track progress on corrective actions. And last, documentation. Keep records of meeting topics, attendees, and action items. You've taken a significant step towards building a safer workplace. Remember, OHS is a continuous journey. Keep exploring, learning, and applying your knowledge to create a healthier environment for everyone. Congratulations on completing the Introduction to Occupational Health and Safety course.